And it is time for the hot topic of the hour. President Biden turning his described big boy speech at the NATO summit into a campaign rally last night, remaining defiant that he will not drop out of the 2024 race, but waffling on whether there's a better choice for a Democrat nominee. Watch. I'm determined on running, but I think it's important that I real I lay fears. If all of a sudden I show up at the convention, everybody says we want somebody else. That's the democratic process. It's not going to happen. I think I'm the best qual. I know, I believe I'm the best qualified to govern. And I think I'm the best qualified to win. But there are other people who could be Trump, too. If your team came back and showed you data that she would fare better against former President Donald Trump, would you reconsider your decision to stay in the race? No, unless they came back and said, there's no way you can win. Me. No one's saying that. No poll says that. Uh, uh, Things are not looking good for the Biden campaign. NBC is reporting that some of Biden's closest allies see his chances of winning re-election as zero. While the New York Times reports some political insiders are weighing how to get Biden to step aside, which includes pitting uh, Kamala Harris's chances against former President Trump, Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama both reportedly expressing concern over Biden's re-election bid in private, unsure of where to proceed after all of the public appearances and Biden's defiance to stay in. A total of 16 House Democrats and one senator all publicly calling for President Biden to withdraw from the presidential race. CBS News says dozens more could join them over the next 48 hours. Lee Carter, it's going to be an interesting 48 hours. That's uh, some people saying we're going to know more information in that time frame. But you've got to believe the Democrats led by Barack Obama are in serious panic mode now. They've got to be, because not only are things not looking good for Joe Biden, they're not looking good for the whole bench. When you look mm. at uh, the polling, when you look at Kamala Harris, you look at Gavin Newsom, you look at Gretchen Whitmer, none of them are doing better than Joe Biden. And so that's problematic, especially because we don't know how they'll perform if they were the candidate. Think back to Jeb Bush. He polled extremely well before he ran. Once he was in the, the, the role, people were looking at him saying, this is not somebody who's presidential. So it's a big risk at this point to put anybody that has not been a candidate out there. And so it's not quite as easy as just saying, let's, let's get rid of Joe and put somebody else in because I don't know who could come in and do better. Well, I mean, that makes sense to me, Lee, because the truth is, is that these are all the Democrat machine policies. And it doesn't matter if it's going to be Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Gretchen Whitmer, uh, you know, Gavin Newsom uh, or whatever bench they say they have. Mm -hmm. It's all the policies of the Democrat machine. I mean, people are questioning who's been running the country for the last year. I would say it's the Democrat machine. It's going to be the same exact policies that have gotten us here. Do you disagree? I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's why you hear people like Joy Reid and others says that you know, Joe Biden could be in a coma and I would still vote for him over right. Donald Trump because it's about saying it's going to be the same no matter who's there. And yeah, I think and that's that's what even voters believe that. Yeah. And, 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 you know, that's being exposed right now as we see more of President Biden's uh, challenges. I mean, he made some extraordinary gaffes this uh, in this press conference last night and yesterday when he was at the NATO meeting um, talking about the Ukrainian president Zelensky actually calling him President Putin. Watch this. And now I want to hand it over to the president of Ukraine who has as much courage as he has determination. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. President Putin. He's going to beat President Putin. President Zelensky. I'm so focused on beating Putin, we got to worry about it. Anyway, Mr. President. I'm better. You are a hell of a lot better. Uh, Sheriff Sony, not good. Well, not good at all. There was that. And we've talked about this. This is before the G7. President Biden on the world stage can be pro- problematic. And it was. Look at how the Italian prime minister had to walk him off uh, and, and steer him away. But I want to pick up on something that you were speaking up earlier. Oh, besides the nine, ga- the nine times that he said anyways last night. That's for another another time, I guess. But Kimberly Strassel writes in the Wall Street Journal this morning, Maria, that the Biden problem is policy. And she goes on to say, 
say Democrats are finally beginning to admit they, uh, the declining Joe Biden is a problem, if they think he's the only one or the biggest, they're as confused as he is. The sharp move to the left, policies, power grabs, deeply unpopular with the electorate. Mr. Biden is a pro- product of this pendulum shift. So it's a bigger story to Lee's point and that the down ballot uh, races are going to be now an issue. And that is why you're now seeing more and more now, what, I think 17 Democrats at this point have now come out publicly and said he needs to step aside. That's why Pelosi and Obama and maybe Chuck Schumer, there might be the ones, Maria, to your point, in the next 48 hours that might have to sit Biden, do- Biden down and finally say, we've got an issue. And yeah. I'm not, because I'm not sure who else he's going to listen to. Mm. I don't think he's going to listen to any of them. I think they're all panicked. I think they've made those appeals to him already. I don't think there's, uh, you know, I mean, they can keep making the appeals, Rebecca, but I think they've pretty much, you know, Obama, Pelosi, Chuck Schumer. I'm sure they've all made the appeals to him in, in private. Maria, when I was growing up, there was a, a childhood st- show called Romper Room, and you would go into it, and the little mirror would spin. And I feel like that's what we've entered into. To ha- for people to come out uh, this morning and say, or last night, that he bought himself more time. He, this is the leader of the free world we are talking about. There is no more time if you are not uh, legally competent. I'm sorry, and that's the way it is. And and so I, I think it's sad for all of these Democrats that care more about getting a Democrat elected than having someone who is actually competent as the president. By the way, uh, Josh Crashour Kr- uh, is on Twitter. And of course, this is uh, he's on the main mainstream uh, media. And he tweeted this yesterday. Viewers of Fox News understood the president's condition better than our audiences, which ought to be a huge wake up call for us. Yes, that's right. Viewers of Fox News and Fox Business knew this years ago because we have been telling the truth. We are just getting started this morning. Quick break. Markets are on the move this morning ahead of a major day of bank earnings. We've got the June producer price index coming out this morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Stay with us for that. Federated Hermes chief equity market strategist Phil Orlando is up next with where investors are poised to put their money now. Then President Biden ramping up his uh, spending in the electric vehicle space as a key automaker union uh, may be hitting the brakes on supporting his re-election. We're going to get into that. Don't miss it. You're watching Mornings with Maria live on Fox Business. Good point. And, and Rebecca, we need to consider that when looking at the jobs numbers in both July and August, given what Phil is saying. Jump in here. Yeah, I think to Phil's point, I agree that the 93 percent is a little bit aggressive, Maria. But um, if you look at the Treasury yields on the two year yesterday, they definitely came down after CPI came out. And that's really a leading indicator that uh, we will probably get a rate cut uh, in the imminent future. So whether it's September or November, I think the Fed now has the data that is starting to really justify and it's going to be really hard for them to continue uh, higher for longer. Yeah. Real quick, Phil, on the banks, they're reporting second quarter earnings today. We'll hear from J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo later this hour, then Citigroup at 8 Uh, a.m. This is always a market moving segment. What do you think on the banks? No question. Uh, revenues for the full uh, S&P 500 should be up about 4.5%. Uh, earnings up about 9%. The banks, are, we think, are going to be uh, slightly below year on year. J.P. Morgan, perhaps, flat to slightly down. Uh, those numbers will improve as we get into the third and fourth quarter. So the guidance here may be as important, if not more important, uh, than the actual numbers. All right. We'll be watching the guidance. Phil, always good to check in. Thanks very much. We appreciate it. Have a great Thank weekend. Thank you, Maria. Have a nice weekend. All right. Phil Orlando joining us. Quick break. And then President Biden going back and forth on whether or not he'll speak with Vladimir Putin during the described big boy NATO speech yesterday. Georgia Congressman Austin Scott is here to breaking it all down, what he's hearing on Capitol Hill of the state of the 2024 race. Stay with us. We'll be right back. President Biden hitting the campaign trail today in Detroit after several Democrats joined together calling for him to drop out of the race just one hour after his press conference last night. The campaign now reportedly preparing for dozens of Democrats to make the same request in the next 48 hours as the president remains defiant about staying in this race. Watch. This wasn't George Clooney. Who do you think it was? Are you saying you think Barack Obama put him up to this? I think that Barack Obama has a lot of influence, and I I think that there's... uh, There's a lot there. This is not about one press conference, one debate, um, you know, one speech. This this is about the presidency of the United States. We cannot be here anymore. This needs to be resolved. I don't know, in the next five to seven days. 
I've always had faith and confidence that he'd always do the right thing. I think in his, in his it's got to be his right thing, what he believes is the right thing. I think Brother Weekend will have a good idea of what's going on. Biden telling reporters last night that he would not drop out unless his staff says there's no way he can win. Watch. If your team came back and showed you data that she would fare better against former President Donald Trump, would you reconsider your decision to stay in the race? No, unless they came back and said, there's no way you can win. Me. No one's saying that. No poll says that. Actually, many of the polls say that several of Biden's allies and campaign officials telling NBC News that his chances of winning the election are, quote, zero. The New York Times reporting his advisors are discussing now how to convince him to step aside and are quietly testing Vice President Kamala Harris's chances against former President Trump. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and former President Obama reportedly uh, behind the scenes uh, to get Biden to reconsider his presidential run. Uh, Cheryl, of course, Barack Obama is pulling the strings here. Barack mm -hmm. Obama's people have been all around Biden running the government. I, I want to know what happened to Susan Rice. Remember, Susan Rice said she was leaving the administration so she could join the campaign. I haven't seen her at all. Mm -hmm. Did she really join Biden's campaign or is she one of the people telling him to step aside? You know, when you when you hear the term you know, shadow government, this is not Russian spies hiding in a bar. This right. is people that are quietly but very powerfully directing the Democratic Party and the administration of Joe Biden. And let's remember, when it comes to Kamala Harris, uh, that it has been widely reported uh, that the, the Obamas initially wanted Kamala Harris, not Joe Biden, back in 2020. That's one thing. Then you talk about with the, the media cover up and how that George Clooney op ed in the New York Times, you know, shook the shook the party to its core, not not Kamala Harris's core, because I'm going to tell you something. She's been and, and so is Jill. They've been cross uh, crossing, cr criss crossing the country, say that 10 times all week. You know what? Harris gave an entire speech earlier this week. She said the, wor the word Biden once, Maria, in the entire I saw speech. That. Yeah. So come on. You can't tell me that the wagons aren't circling and that Kamala Harris is getting ready for her big moment. When that moment's going to be, I don't know. But it's not a question of if, it is when. Yeah. Uh, Biden telling reporters if doctors told him to take a neurologic, neurological exam again, that he will. Watch. I'm surrounded by good docs. If they think there's a problem, I promise you. Or even if they don't think it's a problem, they think I should have a neurological exam again, I'll do it. But no one's suggesting that to me now. Did you have seven docs? Did you have two? Who'd you have? Did you do this? I am not opposed that my doctors tell me they should, I should have another neurological exam. I'll do it. Meanwhile, a new poll finds 67 percent of Americans say that Biden should drop out of the race. Eighty five percent say he's too old to serve out a second term. And a new survey finds only 24 percent of voters think Biden is, quote, mentally sharp. Democrat Colorado Senator John Hickenlooper says his office has received over 3000 calls and emails from voters concerned about President Biden. Lee, Lee Carter, your thoughts? Well, I think this polling is really interesting because um, even Democrats, there's been a huge shift. Just two weeks ago, 45 percent or 40 percent of Democrats felt that maybe Joe Biden should drop out of the race. Now we're seeing that that number is well over 50 percent. So we've seen a 15 percent swing just in the last week of Democrats. And so this is a big problem for Joe Biden. But I have a couple of things that I, I really want to point out here. Number one, as much as everybody's calling for Joe Biden to drop out, their message on the left is that the right is a threat to democracy. There was a primary election. Joe Biden was elected to be the presumptive nominee. And there's a process that needs to be followed. And so if they just try to bypass that, what does that say about their platform? The other thing I want to I want to say is Kamala Harris, as much as she's gotten better, so to speak, over the last couple of years, and she's uh, maybe a little bit different than she was, she's wildly unpopular. She really has very, very low favorability ratings. She does not poll well among young people. And how will anybody trust her? Because there is no way 
that she, of all people, did not know what was going on with Joe Biden. And so trust is going to be a huge issue for her. People don't think that she's necessarily honest today, let alone what they'll think about what she's doing now. And I I just don't think it's a slam dunk for the Democrats. I don't think it's as easy as switching her in for him. I think they're going to have a really, really tough road ahead of them, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Rebecca? You know, I, I take Lee's point, Maria, that, you know, how can anyone trust Kamala? But I wonder, how can anyone trust the, the Democratic Party? I mean, these a lot of people knew, like to your point that you said earlier, Fox has been reporting his status for and we and there's been so much shaming of don't talk about this. Don't say that this is not appropriate. And yet it's really been obfuscated and hidden from the American public. And now it can no longer be hidden. It's so apparently obvious. And they've backed themselves into a corner and up against a wall because it's the 11th hour in the actual year of the election. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, look, Cheryl, we'll see. Um, this is definitely panic mode for the Democrats. We are, what, just 100 days uh, plus away from the election. Right. And you, know, if you, and you mentioned the Democrats. I mean, remember this ABC News Ipsos poll that showed uh, that basically the Democrats won him out. And you can't ignore that. And, and he's, he gaslighted again this week. He gaslighted George Stephanopoulos last Friday. Uh, well, the polls don't reflect that. Well, which polls are you looking at? Because let's be clear, every single one shows, e- even that ABC News poll, 56% of Democrats say he should end his candidacy. Two in three adults say President Biden should step aside. This is, mm-hmm. I, I don't think I've ever seen bipartisanship. <laughs> so strong that yeah. I have when it comes to the fact that he really can't lead our country anymore. Well, you know, it's interesting because usually the Democrats get in line with whatever it is. They're not getting in line right now. Uh, they are certainly uh, being vocal about this. We are just getting started this hour. We've got a lot coming up. We are waiting earnings from Citigroup and the June producer price index coming out in about an hour and a half. Uh, the Citigroup number should be out soon. The word on Wall Street panel is here. We've got expectations there on the heels of J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo reporting earnings and sending those. Welcome back. It is time now for the word on Wall Street. Top investors watching you, Money. Join me now is former Gartman letter editor and University of Akron and Diamond Fund chairman Dennis Gartman. Also with us is Rebecca Walser today. Dennis, thanks so much for joining the conversation. Good to see you. And Rebecca, I want to get your take on these bank earnings, the major banks reporting second quarter earnings today. We've already heard from J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo. Both stocks are down. Uh, even though they reported a double beat, J.P. Morgan profits up on rising investment banking fees and an eight billion dollar accounting gain from a share exchange deal with Visa. CEO Jamie Dimon, however, says inflation and interest rates may stay higher than the market expects. Wells Fargo is the story of the morning, uh, along with Bank of New York, by the way, because Bank of New York is up two and a half percent. But Wells Fargo is down five and a quarter percent right now. Profits down as the lenders shelled out more money to hold on to deposits on intense competition for customer money. We'll hear from Citigroup at 8 a.m. Eastern this morning. Rebecca, how would you assess these bank earnings so far? Yeah, it's really strange to get a double beat around both companies and have them actually trend immediately to the downside. So that really means that there's some kind of underlying guidance that's negative or there's some kind of number in the report that people weren't expecting. Obviously, with JP, we can see that the $8 billion visa uh, revenue is uh, really maybe um, a, a downside because, you know, we were expecting uh, 45 and we got 50, but that's with an $8 uh, eight million a billion dollar accounting entry. You know, as far as Wells Fargo goes, they and also JP Morgan, you know, all of their acquisitions, Maria, they've really raised their operational costs. And, and obviously with higher cost of capital, that's more difficult to deal with. But I think what's really happening with these banks is their their front end costs are higher because the, the short end, we have an inverted yield curve. So the short end of capital is higher than the longer end of capital. And banks don't really make money on the short end. They make money on the long run. And so what they have to borrow higher and lend out at a lower rate, they're going to not have as much net uh, interest income. So I just think that there's some guidance in here that is negative and that overall the market is seeing that, jizz it's really going to be hard and uh, unless we get a rate cut to really continue with the bank earnings as we expect. Yeah, I mean, people want more clarity on the net interest income. I yep. think that's the issue with the Wells Fargo stock, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely right. Dennis, uh, we were expecting six rate cuts at the beginning of the year. Now we're going to get three. No wonder they want more clarity on the net interest income from these guys. But we're also focused on economic data. We'll get the producer price index out this morning at 8 a.m. Eastern, uh, 830 Eastern, rather, in about an hour and 15 minutes. Economists are expecting prices to be up one-tenth of a percent month over month and 2.3 percent year over year. 
The Journal is writing that yesterday's lower CPI uh, showed a slowdown in prices and gives the Fed a clear path to cut interest rates by September, Dennis. What do you uh, take away from these uh, numbers? I've said for months that there would be one, maybe two interest rate cuts by the Fed this year. They laughed at me earlier this year. Yeah. Nobody's laughing now. I think the odds of a cut in September have been raised a bit, but I think the odds are greater that the, the, the next cuts in the overnight Fed funds rate will come in November and December after the election so the Fed can, can obviously look less political in its circumstances. Well, so I've I mean, said well, that one or two yes. cuts would be it, and that'll be, that'll be the extent of it for this year. Well, you, There'll be more next year. You've also talked about holding gold in, in this moment of uncertainty. We want to take a look at yes. yields, which are up this morning, but also gold, uh, which uh, this morning uh, it, it reclaimed its $2,400 mark yesterday after the CPI data lifted rate cut bets. Like, take a look at gold this morning. At 2406 it is down a fraction. What's your outlook for gold in the second half of the year here? Do you still think investors need to load up on gold? I don't think you need to load up on gold, but I think you need to own some gold. I, I've owned gold for quite a long period of time, been very, very consistently bullish on the gold market for months and months, for years, actually. And I continue to be bullish, but I sold a few calls against my gold yesterday that were out of the money earlier this week are now in the money. So my gold is probably going to be called away uh, this afternoon, but I'll look to buy any weakness that we get. And I think the fact that we've gone above $2,400 an ounce tells me that the lower the movement is from the lower left to the upper right as the as the monetary authorities continue to be expansionary on balance that's what's driven gold prices higher and gold in dollar terms is has lagged well behind gold in euro and yen terms so if you have the ability to do so buy gold in yen terms buy gold in euro terms i think that's been the better trade and likely to continue to be the best trade of all mm -hmm. and what about stocks dennis are you expecting a rocky second half I think there will have be a very rocky second half, no question about it. I think we, stocks have gotten egregiously overpriced. I'm marginally net short for myself, and the operative word here is marginally. I got short last week just at the at the margin, and if we see, and I'm using the VIXI as as my uh, surrogate for being net short, and if we try to start to take the VIXI back above uh, 13 per 13 or so, 1325 or so, I'll add to that trade. But I think stocks have gotten ridiculously overpriced. Obviously, the MAG-7 has, has led them the, the ridiculousness uh, to, to the upside. And um, the, only other, the only alternative that I bought a few uh, real estate uh, REITs yesterday, I think that's been, uh, that they have been unduly sold to the downside. So if you have to be bullish, buy real estate REITs, but on balance, you should be bearish of the stock market. Wow. Rebecca, uh, you were nodding your head there. You're also expecting some volatility here. I mean, does it have to do with earnings? Because we are we got a couple of banks this morning, but the earnings parade is only going to ramp up in the coming week. Should we be selling into the earnings period? Well, you know, Maria, it's a problem because the market did already price in all these cuts and then obviously paired itself back. But I really see a lot of disruption globally, economically. You know that I'm a gold bug as well. I've been a gold bug for a while now, especially in this macroeconomic environment that we're in with the BRICS nations and the Enbridge and all of those things that are happening. But really, I think that the economic of people could be started even with just our political situation that we have here. There's no stability right now. And that is not the time that you want that. World War Three on multiple continents, you know, happening potentially. It's all around anything. This market is so thinly on it, the rails that anything that goes wrong, I think we're going to have a, a massive economic malaise. I'm sorry. Wow. Yeah. All right. We will leave it there. A great conversation, guys. Thank you. Dennis Gartman, thank you so much. Rebecca, you're with thank us you. all morning long. We appreciate that. Stay with us. Topic of the hour. Well, the left wing media changing their tune now, taking a victory lap after President Biden's mediocre at best press conference last night. Watch. I haven't they had him doing a lot more of these uh, that that really is about as comfortable as he's going to get. There was a moment at the beginning where he said Vice President Trump instead of Vice President Harris, but he did have lengthy answers on, on subject areas that he knows very well. I think it's fair to say there were obviously some verbal missteps. There were some periods of haltingness, but also periods of genuinely impressive command and fluency. He is not only strong on foreign policy, he is just just fundamentally right on foreign policy. So give some credit where credit is due. It was a solid performance, except for one flood.
Ah, grasping for straws. Former President Obama and former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi are not along for the ride. They are reportedly trying to find ways to steer Biden out of the race. And The New York Times is reporting that Biden's advisors are also discussing how to convince him to step aside as they quietly test Kamala Harris's chances against Donald Trump. NBC is reporting Biden's allies and campaign officials, quote, see his chances as winning as zero. Lee Carter, your reaction. Well, I think when the bar is so low, it's easy to exceed it. And I think that's what happened. I think everybody was expecting it to be a really disastrous performance last night. And he was solidly average. He had a couple of gaffes, but he was able to perform in some ways. So if you wanted to see Joe Biden perform well, you thought he did an amazing job. If you're looking for more mistakes, you're focusing on the mistakes. But the one thing I will say is that no one is looking at this and saying, you know what? I have no doubt that he's fine. Everybody remembers the debate performance. They remember the interview with George Stephanopoulos. We remember all of the things that we've recently seen. And everybody is looking at him and thinking about the conversation they had with their parents about whether or not they can continue driving. Is this somebody that you want in this seat? And I think the answer for a lot of people is no. We're seeing polls that say about 72 percent Americans say absolutely not. He's not able to have the keys to this country anymore. So what are we going to do about it? Lee, I mean, look, isn't it true that it's all in Biden's hands? I mean, there's really no mechanism there for the Democrats to take him out, force him out. He has to make the decision because they're not going to be able to take the keys away from him. It's absolutely right. It's in his hands. But we all have experienced this in our own lives. It's really hard to get somebody to face the facts. And we don't know how long it's been since it's this serious. We don't know. Is is he ready to acknowledge it? We don't know where he is in all of this. It might be Mm. he's going through his own stages of grief right now. And he's still saying, I'm fine. You've had that conversation with somebody that you love. Are you still able to do all the things that you used to? And it takes people a while to come to terms with that. And I don't think that he's able to come to terms with it. When you hear how he talked last night, he talked about himself constantly. He thinks he's still capable of doing it. I think he really does believe that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Rebecca, there's a real firewall firewall on on Capitol Hill, and it's smoldering and it's getting bigger uh, in terms of Democrats. So it it all comes down to whether or not the pressure is going to get so hot. That, in fact, he makes the decision and says, OK, I'm stepping down so far with Hunter Biden and Jill, his you know, first lady uh, pushing back. It, it doesn't look like he wants to, but they're still trying to test combinations. They're talking about Josh Shapiro, governor of Pennsylvania. They're talking about North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper as a potential running mate for Kamala Harris. You know, Maria, I agree with all of those sentiments. I want to talk about the fact that what Lee said is she said that the bar was so low that it was easy for him just to go out and be average and beat it. The bar is the lowest when we need it to be the highest. We literally are in an economic war in this country globally with the BRICS block and moving away from the dollar that we have to really consider. We have Speaker Johnson saying that he wants to pass additional sanctions and tariffs on Chinese goods before the end of this year. So we've got economic war happening and we have potentially global war happening. We're in a proxy war with Russia through Ukraine. We've got China attacking, looking at Taiwan. So we have in the Middle East. We have so many things globally happening. This is not the time to have the low bar. We have to have the high bar. And I can't believe people aren't saying we have to have competence in this position. Yeah. I mean, Cheryl, we've got a couple of dates that we're looking at. I mean, look, people are talking about a decision being made in the next 48 hours, Cheryl. Right. But when you look at the dates on the calendar, July 21st, the earliest the DNC could officially nominate via the meeting of the Credentials Committee. August 7th is the Ohio ballot access deadline. And then, of course, the beginning of the DNC is a couple of weeks later, August 19th. It seems to me that a decision is going to be made. And I have a feeling it's going to be that he steps down, but I don't think it's going to this, be in the next week forty hours. Oh, you don't think I so? I don't okay. think so. I think what's, what I think what we're seeing play out. Listen to Nancy Pelosi and friend Shell brought this up when he was here. Look, Nancy Pelosi doesn't say anything that isn't calculated and planned. And remember what she said: Let's wait and see how this week goes. This is NATO. Let's just wait and see to see how the, the cards are going to play out. And then if the pressure mounts, it mounts, and I think it will. 
But, you know, one thing about all the chaos in the Democratic Party right now, and Peggy Noonan, who is a very respected presidential historian, wrote in the Wall Street Journal this morning, if Democrats are wise, they will embrace the chaos. Even the realists say that Biden's a problem, but you can't remove him. Okay, that's that's the argument on the realist side. Well, it's too tough. It's too difficult. It's going to create chaos. But then she says, you know what? They're going to try to hunker down, try to survive the down ballot drag as the old man hands Trump a victory and probably Congress as well. You know, take those words to heart if you're a Democrat this morning. This right. is where your party's going. Markets are up right now. We are 10 minutes away from potentially market moving news. We're awaiting the June producer price index. It's out in 10 minutes' time. Navalier and Associates founder and chief investment officer Louis Navalier will weigh in on that. Plus, former White House counsel.